Dr. Tom O'Brien, welcome to the sessions. Thank you, Sean. I'm really, really happy to have you here because we normally talk about gluten, yes. but we're not going to talk so much about that today. We're going to talk about turning down the inflammation. But before we get to that, I want to know one thing. I want to know where that passion you have for health and digestion, where does that come from? Bottom line, as of eight years ago, we now know, no question, your children, your future children, have a shorter projected lifespan than you have. Our kids are gonna die earlier than us. Bottom line, we're, we're killing ourselves off quicker than ever before in the history of civilization. Along with that, the World Health Organization tells us that the United States is ranked second in overall health care, second from the bottom. And we all keep our heads buried. We don't listen. We rather would, you know, look, look at these drug ads on television nowadays. And, you know, you've got all these beautiful looking people, these gorgeous women, these tight blouses, and these guys with their chest, nice big biceps, you know, they're happy and they're playing around and they're talking about how great life is with this medication because they don't have their symptoms anymore. In the background, there's a little voice saying, warning, this is going to kill you, it may, it may cripple you. And, but we don't listen to all that. We see the happiness, right? And we allow all this stuff to just indoctrinate it, us with let's keep the status quo, let's keep going the same way we've been going in terms of how we take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And now we know for the first time in the history of civilization, our children have a shorter lifespan, a shorter projected lifespan than their parents. Mm. That's why. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunate to hear. Now, you're initiating change. Last year you did a gluten summit, you had over 100,000 people sign up. Talk about how things are changing a little bit, how the word is getting out. Frequently now, uh, I meet people in seminars uh, or even in the airport and I say, Dr. O'Brien, oh, thank you so much. You, you changed my life. Your summit, my daughter doesn't have rheumatoid arthritis anymore or whatever the condition was they were suffering with. And people are telling people are telling people. So this whole idea, which I learned from you about how to carry a message out is via the internet and by just carrying your passion, carry your message out. I've learned this from you, so mm -hmm. thank you very much. Give, uh, You're welcome, happy to help. important to acknowledge that. Um, um, I believe this is, this is the vehicle today to reach more people with the message. Mm -hmm. And the message is, there's no magic pill that's going to fix you. There's no magic food that you avoid or you eat that's going to fix you. We all need to learn how do we take care of this body? And we're fighting the system. We're fighting the education that's coming down to us in television and radio and newspaper and magazines. We have to be resistant to all of that and look at what makes sense. What does the science tell us? All right, how do I have to modify my lifestyle? Yeah, the message you wanna get out today is about inflammation. What is inflammation and why is it important? Inflammation is critical in our body. Inflammation is not bad for you. Excessive inflammation is bad for you. Inflammation is our body's way. My good friend, Dr. Mark Houston, a vascular biologist from Vanderbilt University, he has a phrase for this that says it so well. The body has a limited number of options to deal with an unlimited number of insults. We're, we're bombarded all the time by toxins and environmental exposures and the emotional stress of living in this crazy world that we live in, but we only have a few ways that our bodies are designed to fight this or to deal with this, this um, assault on mm -hmm. our systems. Mm -hmm. Those ways that we have are built into us, they're part of our blueprint of life, and it comes from our ancestors. How did our ancestors survive when they were under physical stress or chemical stress or emotional stress? How did they survive? The way they survived was by the immune system activating an inflammatory cascade to destroy the bacteria coming in. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's just a good thing. But excessive inflammation is the problem. And in our world today, the reason, we'll go to gluten for a minute, the reason why gluten sensitivity has just skyrocketed, it's not because of more education, which is great, but it is more people are getting sicker. Now, as you know, it's 400% more in the last 50 years um, are getting sensitive and getting celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity. It's 400% in the last 50 years. The reason for this, what the science tells us, 
It's a loss of oral tolerance. What that means is that we, the straw that broke the camel's back, there are too many insults coming into our system that our body's re response mechanism, inflammation, we're just responding and responding and responding and responding. And there's so many insults coming in that it's overwhelming the system. Now it's causing tissue destruction and dysfunction. And so it's a loss of oral tolerance, which comes from all of the environmental toxins that we're exposed to, like never before in history, from the bisphenol A that's in water, in the water bottles, to uh, mercury that's in our fish, to lead that's in the air. Um, we're just exposed to so much, it's overwhelming our bodies, and we have much more inflammation now. Here's, here's a really good visual for this. It takes 976,000 mouse traps to fill up a football field laid side by side. And you and I both know the guy that figured this out. He used to wear pocket protectors. He doesn't anymore. It's Dr. Jeffrey Bland, right? 976,000 mouse traps. Cock each mouse trap. Put a ping pong ball on each mouse trap. Now you have 976,000 mouse traps with ping pong balls on them in this huge football field. So you look out on the football field and all you see is white. It's all ping pong balls. Walk along the sideline with one ping pong ball. Throw that ping pong ball out onto the football field. It hits one mousetrap, pop. Now there's two ping pong balls in the air, the one you threw out there and the one in the mousetrap that just popped. They hit two mousetraps, pop, pop. Now there's four ping pong balls in the air, pop, 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 eight, pop, 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 16, and you have what's called a cascade reaction. This thing has a life of its own, and the initial irritant is long gone. That's what happens in our bodies when we lose oral tolerance. Pop, 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 just takes off and it has a life of its own. That's the inflammatory cascade that we all have to get educated about that's going on inside of us and you can't feel it until you destroy enough tissue. Now your symptoms start, usually kind of small, and they gradually build up and get worse and worse and worse. You go to a doctor, for the symptoms, whatever they are, I mean, they don't look at the inflammatory cascade going on. They treat the symptoms like they show you on television. You take the drug for the symptoms. But pop, 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 pop is still going on and it's gonna show itself somewhere else. Hmm. That's what we have to deal with. So this summit that you're doing is critically important for people to learn all the little bits and pieces of what's pulling on your chain. You know, what's gonna cause that chain, that link of the chain to break. You know, my analogy for it is you pull at a chain, it breaks at the weakest link. It's at one end, the middle, the other end. It's your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, wherever your genetic weak link is. The pull is all the pop, 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 the excessive inflammation because of the loss of tolerance. We've crossed that line. That pulls on the chain and the link breaks wherever your weak link is. Mm -hmm. So it might be your brain for some people. For example, gluten. It might be your brain or it might be your kidneys or it might be unexplained miscarriages. It just depends on where your genetic weak link is. So that whole process, pop, 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 causing the loss of oral tolerance, pulling on your chain, and the weak link, here come the symptoms, and we think it's okay to treat the symptoms. So you treat the symptoms, and you're one of the statistics. Number two in the world, second from the bottom in overall health. And we die earlier, we have more disease, we have more dysfunction, our kids die earlier now, or they're projected to die earlier than ever before in civilization. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line message on all of that is we need to learn what's pulling on the chain. And you just sensibly, rationally reduce the pull on the chain. So you find out you're sensitive to a particular food, get the food out. You find that you have heavy metals, get the heavy metals out. Well, I guess I really can't eat my favorite fish because it's all, you know, tuna, all tuna now has mercury unless there's a few tunas that don't, but in general, tuna has high loads of mercury because the world's toxic with mercury now. Mm -hmm. This goes beyond gluten, of course, and today you're going to talk about six pearls, we'll say, six foods that either pull on that chain or help to heal that chain. What's the first one? The first one is carbohydrate selection. They did a study that for nutritionists, when I first presented this, this study at a nutritional symposium, everybody's jaw dropped. Because it, uh, what, what? So they took two groups of people. One group for 12 weeks, they gave them rye bread and rye pasta as their carbohydrate. The other group, they gave oats, wheat bread, and white potatoes for their carbohydrates. 
and it was 34% of, of the entire meal was carbohydrates, but they got either rye bread and pasta or oats, wheat bread, and white potatoes for 12 weeks, three months. Then they gave them a washout period of three months. Go back and eat whatever you usually eat. Then they switched the groups and they gave them the other rye bread, pasta, or wheat, oats, and um, uh, white potatoes. What did they find out? They just looked for what turns on inflammation and what doesn't. What doesn't? What they found was that in the group eating the rye bread and rye pasta, it turned on 71 genes to downregulate inflammation, to turn down the inflammatory cascade. 71 different genes in the group that ate the wheat bread, the oats, and the white potatoes, it turned on 62 genes for more inflammation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what, white potatoes? Yes, white potatoes activate genes for inflammation. So, the message here is not that you don't eat white potatoes, but that you don't eat exclusively inflammatory foods, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have a sensitivity to wheat, of course, we all know you have to get the wheat out of your diet, but if you don't have a sensitivity to wheat, you're still gonna turn on those genes for inflammation. So you don't want your carbohydrates to be a majority of your carbohydrates in that category of oats, wheat bread, and white potatoes. And those were the only foods that were tested. So in we that can't, study, those were the only So foods. we can't extrapolate this to mean something else like For other, other grains, and right, we can't. But that just opened up the world to us that, wow, the carbohydrates that you select, even if they're good carbohydrates like potatoes, mm -hmm. even if they're good carbohydrates, they may cause more inflammation in my body. What else you got? GMO foods. I'm sure you'll have other experts talking about GMO foods. Jeffrey Smith. Oh, there we go. The man. Uh, yes. Um, I just want to say one thing about GMO foods and how it relates to the digestive process and our, our intestines' ability to digest food. The toxin, the BT toxin, that is in GMO foods. The way that it works, and the, the way that it works is that this, this toxin, insects eat the food, the toxin goes into the insect's digestive system, it tears away at the intestines of the insect's digestive system, causing big holes. That's severe intestinal. For someone who doesn't know, the actual food has the toxin in it, right? Like it reproduces to make That's correct. Like corn, when, right? When the food grows, it's got the toxin in it. That's weird. I know. I know. That's the major concern. And that's why they're outlawed in so many countries, mm -hmm. but not in the U.S. So this toxin gets into the uh, intestines of the insect and it causes big holes in the insect's gut. They die. So that's the purpose of this toxin. Well, we now know it's causing intestinal permeability in humans when you eat GMO foods. Not that it's killing you, it's no studies ever suggested that, but it's another pull on the chain mm -hmm. of the intestines that will contribute to more intestinal permeability, which in previous discussions we've shown is the gateway in the development of autoimmune diseases. How do we know what's causing intestinal permeability? Is there research on that? Oh, you bet, you bet. The research was published, the first studies came out, I believe it was three years ago, and there's been a few more since then that have validated. Now these studies, these researchers fight tooth and nail because the politics of all this are terrible. Mm -hmm. That some researchers have lost their jobs because they speak the truth yeah. about it, right? I've heard that story from Jeffrey Smith. Yes. Arpad Pushtai. Yeah, everybody should Google Exactly that, right. if you can spell it. Yeah, we'll put it in the if notes. You, if you can spell it, right. <laughs> so you mentioned off camera that um, this toxin can be found in, was it pregnant mothers and? Yes, oh my goodness. Yeah. It is 92% um, uh, of maternal blood and 80, 81 or 80, 80 or 81% of fetal blood has this BT toxin in it. Hmm. These are our newborns. Is there no, a, excuse me, these, this, these are fetuses still in utero, right. and they've got it in them already. Is there any research showing that this toxin can come from any other source, or is it just genetically modified foods? Just GMO, as far as I know, I'm not an expert on this, but from my reading, is GMO foods. Okay, so would this be, would this tell the consumer, of course, stay away from GMO foods, but also to prefer organic foods, because oh, absolutely. they're always GMO free? That's correct. Okay, cool, what's your third point? Here's one that's on the other side of the equation that's actually really great for us, and that is blueberries. I'm going to talk about just two reasons why blueberries are great for us. The first one, studies show that one cup of blueberries a day 
reverses the cognitive decline of up to 13 years within three years. So if you have one cup of blueberries a day for three years, you reverse the loss of brain function of up to 13 years. Hmm. That's tremendous. And they're healthy for you. They're very low in the glycemic index. They're, they're loaded with uh, antioxidants, polyphenols, and one of the polyphenols is called pterostilbene. Now, pterostilbene, they did a study, this was with animals, where they gave the animals azoxymethane. That's a chemical compound that we know causes colon cancer in people. And so they gave these animals azoxymethane, and half of the group, they gave them pterostilbene that comes from blueberries. The other half, they didn't. What did they find? There was 57% fewer cancerous lesions in the animals that also had blueberries with the azoxymethane exposure. 57% less colon cancer in these animals. And what we know in humans, it's the same thing, is that it turns on the genes to calm down inflammation and it turns on the genes to slow down cancer cell propagation hmm. and development. So once again, we're talking epigenetics, what happens around the genes. And this is one of those that turns on genes to calm down that pop, pop, pop cascade in the two areas that we talked about here today, which is the brain and the colon. And there's other studies about the value of blueberries. It's just a really good food to include as got to have it regularly on your list. Are you familiar with the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen? I am. And the Dirty Dozen, I believe, are those produce items that you should always buy organic, right? Blueberries are on that list. That's correct. That's why you always want to get organic blueberries. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a study that just came out very, very recently, earlier this week. And they looked at uh, a common insecticide in our food chain today. And they, uh, we, we, of course, have seen studies before on this uh, insecticide that showed that uh, it causes ovarian dysfunction, uh, kidney inflammation, and obesity. Right? And what they found, they just published this, is that that effect goes for three generations. This is unbelievable. Is that a, the goody mi mice? No, nope, no, nope. the, the, this was not the goody mouse. This was, uh, um, I don't know what animals they used, okay. actually. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. But um, it went for three generations so that the great grandchildren had higher exposure or higher incidence of ovarian dysfunction, kidney inflammation, and obesity uh, than other animals whose great-grandparents did not get exposed to the chemical. So you're not eating just for yourself, you're eating for your grandkids. That's right. And what the summary in that study suggested was that um, um, it's, it's not changing the genes because the DNA of these great-grandchildren were the same, exactly the same. The DNA wasn't changed, but it's affecting the epigenetics, what's happening around the genes so that the genes for inflammation keep get turning on, keep get turning on, keep get turning on from the residue, I don't, I don't know what it is, the residue, there, there can't be any residue, but for some, the, the mechanism of activating the genes of inflammation kept being turned on for the children and the grandchildren. Hmm. I heard you have some news about high fat diets that we need to know. Oh my goodness. Um, fat is not a four letter word. It's not bad for you. Bad fat is bad for you, and we know that, and you've had lots of interviews on that topic. There's another um, arena to consider with fats, and that is the volume of fats. And if we're having too much fat, I mean, higher concentrations of fats in your meals, uh, especially if it's more undesirable fats, these fats can escort lipopolysaccharides into the bloodstream. What are those? I'll, I'll get to that. Let me just complete this one part and then we'll get to what LPS are. Uh, what's important is that it doesn't require intestinal permeability, the leaky gut, for these fat molecules um, uh, to escort lipopolysaccharides into the bloodstream. They go right through the cell mm -hmm. as opposed to between the cells. Just in case someone's just jumping into this event today and they're not familiar with the term leaky gut, can you give us a, a, a brief on what that is? You bet. Your intestines are a tube. The tube is 20, 25 feet long. The inside of the tube is lined with shag carpeting. This shag is where calcium's absorbed, this shag fats, this shag proteins, all the shags absorb different nutrients. Celiac 
disease, for example, um, with the gluten sensitivity. Celiac disease is when your shags wear down and you get Berber. You have Berber, you, you don't absorb your nutrients, you get osteoporosis. But these shags have a cheesecloth covering them, so only certain size molecules can get through. So as food's going down the digestive tract and the digestive enzymes are breaking down the food, it's got to be broken down smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until the particles are so small, they go right through the cheesecloth into the shags and then into the bloodstream. If you have tears in the cheesecloth, these molecules coming down and being broken down by the digestive enzymes that haven't been broken down enough yet, to fit through the cheesecloth. Now these larger molecules get through the cheesecloth that's torn and into the bloodstream. They're called macromolecules, big molecules. And these macromolecules get into the bloodstream. The brain says, whoa, what's this? This is not good for me. I better fight this. I can't use this to make new muscle or new brain hormones called neurotransmitters. I better fight this. And now you make antibodies. The immune system makes antibodies to this macromolecule. Maybe the macromolecule is tomato. Now you get allergies to tomato, or beef, or bananas, or really good foods. All of a sudden, you do a test for 90 foods, you're allergic to 20 foods. Yeah. The doctor says you're allergic to 20 foods. He says, oh my God, that's everything I eat. Well, yes, it's because your immune system's trying to protect you, because these macromolecules got in, right. and it's just fighting it. So what do you have to do? You heal the cheesecloth, and then the immune system calms down. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's what intestinal permeability is, or slang term is the leaky gut. It's tears in the cheesecloth. So fats, high amounts of fats, will escort lipopolysaccharides, which are big molecules, huge molecules, through the cell. Not, you, it doesn't require tears in the cheesecloth. Gotcha. It'll go right through. Now, what are lipopolysaccharides? As you know, the good bacteria in our gut, there are 10 times more cells of good bacteria in our gut than all the cells in our body put together. Ten times more, you add up all the muscle cells, bone cells, kidney cells, organ cells, you add them all up, there's ten times more cells of the bacteria in our gut. And there's a hundred times more genes in this bacteria than in the human genome. And genes control function. So um, we haven't had this discussion yet uh, off camera on, on the second glass of wine, and we need to do this is that are we really humans with a whole lot of bacteria or are we bacteria having a human experience? Mm, I've heard that before, yeah. yeah what are we? Be, well, there's 10 times more of them than us. Yeah. Who's us? <laughs> right? And they control function. Mm -hmm. and it's a whole new world of science called enteric neuroscience and how the gut controls brain function. It's well known now. So, uh, this bacteria, the good bacteria, because of exposure to antibiotics, um, and they spray the food now with antibiotics in the fields, and so the, we're eating good vegetables, but they have residue of antibiotics on them, so we're getting antibiotics all the time now. The antibiotics kill some of the good bacteria. When the good bacteria, which is predominant, and just the army is there, you can't have a lot of bad bacteria if you've got a huge army around. You can have some infiltrators once in a while, but they can't get a hold, they can't uh, reproduce and form colonies because the, the good bacteria um, is just there to protect you. But when you lose too much of the good bacteria, the bad bacteria is called uh, opportunistic organisms. If there's an opportunity, they're going to thrive and take over. And they do. Um, and when they take over, they produce an exhaust. And that exhaust is called lipopolysaccharides. This exhaust, if it gets into your bloodstream, wrecks havoc. It's as deadly as a gluten sensitivity in terms of all of the different possible imbalances, manifestations that we wouldn't want. For example, in cardiac units, you have an acute heart attack. You survive. You're in intensive care. They check your LPS levels to determine if you're going to survive for the next few days or not. Hmm. that if you have elevated levels of LPS, lipopolysaccharide, you're at high risk of sudden death uh, when you survive a heart attack. Uh, in the brain, it is the primary trigger, some of our neurologists are telling us it's the primary trigger for depression that's not resolved by, by either medications or by good diets or by getting foods that you're sensitive out of your diet. Your depression stays with you, lipopolysaccharide toxicity. Are the lipopolysaccharides getting to the brain? They are, they are. They can, 
I should say it that way. If you have a blood-brain barrier defect, if you've got leaky gut, leaky Cryo, brain. Leaky brain. And we've talked about that before, that uh, the mechanism that causes leaky gut, those same antibodies will cause leaky brain. Mm -hmm. What about the joints? It, uh, my gosh, uh, when I do my lectures about um, uh, uh, autoimmune musculoskeletal diseases, we talk about rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis, uh, uh, spondyloarthropathies, a big word, sorry, but these, these different types of inflammatory arthritises. When they take fluid out of the joints of these people, they're loaded with the bad bacteria. And when you deal with the bad bacteria, the arthritic pains go away because the inflammation goes away. And so rheumatoid, it doesn't reverse. You've got the joint damage, you've got the joint damage, but the symptomatology goes down dramatically when you treat the gut for the bad bacteria. Chronic fatigue? Chronic fatigue, there's a great study, there are many, but one that I love is Dr. Michael Mays. He's a molecular psychiatrist in Belgium and he's published over 200 studies on this. And he shows, and he does a really great case study of a 13-year-old girl, all of a sudden after three bouts of antibiotics for a sinus infection that didn't go away, uh, she couldn't get out of bed. Hmm. And she was on the swim team, she was great, uh, a B student, and uh, all of a sudden she couldn't go to school, she couldn't think, uh, and her parents took her to doctors. It took two years where they told her it's all in her head, they wanted to put her on drugs, parents wouldn't do it and they found Dr. Mays, and he ran the test, he found her LPS levels were sky high. And it took two and a half years of aggressive therapy to get the LPS under control. So, so you said she couldn't think. This is a she brain think. fog thing too? Because I know a lot of people have brain fog. Oh, it's a tremendous brain fog, you bet. It's a big cause of brain fog. Mm -hmm. uh, you eat a bad meal, uh, or you eat a meal and you know it's not really the best food for you. Uh, next day you wake up and you really can't think very clearly. One of the mechanisms may be the inflammation that's coming from the LPS exposure. How does somebody know they have LPS? You have to do a blood test to find it. What blood test is that? Well, it comes from Cyrex Labs. Array number two looks for antibodies to LPS. Mm -hmm. um, if you're making antibodies, your immune system is saying, this stuff's in the bloodstream. And there's only four ways that I know of, five ways uh, that I know of, that LPS can get in the bloodstream. Either you've got gingivitis, periodontitis, it's coming in through bleeding gums, stuff like that. You've got an open wound, and it's coming in through that. Um, you've got intestinal permeability. You've got septicemia, which is an infection in your organs, and you're really sick. Or you've got the fifth one we're talking about here, lipid raft transcytosis, meaning fats are carrying the LPS through a healthy gut into the bloodstream. Lipid raft. Huh? Lipid raft, like a raft for a boat. Yeah. Lipid, lipid is a term for fats. Lipid raft transcytosis. That's a good visual. That's a right really there. good visual, and it's a good Scrabble word. You really will impress <laughs> people you use that one. Well, I'm sure the audience is wondering, how do you get rid of something like that? Uh, you've got to do an antibacterial protocol. You have to identify where is it, where is it coming from, and for the docs that are watching this program, uh, you have to remember biofilms, that many of these uh, 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 bacteria, these pathogenic bacteria, they've been there for quite a while and they've developed defenses to protect them. And they have a force field around them called a biofilm. And the National Institute of Health tells us that people die from infections, antibiotic resistant infections. They often have biofilms and the antibiotic can't get at the bacteria. And it takes up to a hundred times, according to the NIH, a hundred times the dosage of antibiotics to deal with a bacteria that for someone else it just takes a single dose to deal with. It can take a hundred times if you've had that bacteria at a little higher concentration for quite a while, you've been living with it, not feeling too bad, not feeling too good, but not feeling too bad, and they, it's built a force field around it. Is there any way to know you have a biofilm or is it just a kind of a trial and error? I don't know how to identify That's that. Yet. It really is trial and error at this point. It's the, the science is so new on this one. So are you saying that, because I know a lot of people out there love their high fat diets. There's some nutritional organizations and books and whatnot that promote high fat diets and ketosis and all of these things, right? And we've heard of uh, native people who eat high fat diets, like the Inuit, for example. Now, are you saying that high fat diets, you should completely take them off the table, or are they a problem for people who just have lipoprotein, lipo lipopolysaccharide to toxicity? Yeah, no, you should not, um, do not take them off the table. High fat diets are good. For some people, they're really good. For mm -hmm. other people, they're not. You know, there's no one diet that's right for everyone, right. but there's nothing wrong with a quality high-fat diet unless you have intestinal permeability. I mean, if you've got small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which you're going to hear more about on this summit, uh, if you've got that one, um, that would cause 
more LPS production. Uh, if you've got intestinal permeability, um, high fat diets can cause more LPS transference. Uh, but in general, high fat diets are really good for some people. And when you say high fat diets are causing this rafting thing, do you mean all fats or particular fats? No, um, they haven't, the research hasn't been too specific yet, but they've identified, they checked coconut oil was fine. So coconut oil or those fats from coconuts, but palm oil was a primary raft for lipid raft tri transcytosis. Do you think coconut oil wasn't a raft because it's antimicrobial? I hadn't thought about that, but that's a really good line of thought. So blueberries, good guys. We should be wary of the high fat diets if it's a problem for us. Mm -hmm. What else you got? The way we prepare our foods have an impact on that food's effect in our body. Researchers call it thermal processing of food. What's thermal processing of food? It's you cook it. It's a fancy way for saying cooking. <laughs> That's right, right, fancy way of saying you cook it. So when you cook food, um, we always produce, I, I believe it's always, um, advanced glycation end products. They're called AGEs, A-G-E, advanced glycation end products. Advanced glycation end products will trigger or cause intestinal permeability and increased inflammation systemically. So I'm not saying don't cook. I'll, I'll give the summary at the end, so don't worry about that. But we know that advanced glycation end products, a really good example is when you make bread. If you make bread, I don't know if you know this, but I was a baker for many years. You were a baker? I was a baker. You served people gluten? I did. Get out of here. In I detail. did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> like a gluten that dealer. Was another stage of life. Oh, huh, okay. <laughs> but when you need bread, and I'd need 48 loaves a day, four dozen loaves a day. When you need bread, this gooey substance, you know, it feels really good in your hands when you, if you've got the right doughy consistency. But then when you bake it, you got this crust around it, right? That's glycating the proteins. So it's, it's a reaction between proteins and the sugars in the food that glycate it. That's the term for it, glycate, another Scrabble word. We might call this the Scrabble lecture today, right? And when you glycate the food, when we eat that glycated food, it triggers intestinal permeability, it triggers an inflammatory cascade, pop, 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 in our bloodstream. Any cooked foods that have proteins and sugars in them, because the proteins and sugars merge and form this crust, and it crusts your cells. That's what advanced glycation end products do, is they crust your cells. So you don't want to and carry that out. What they've shown is increased insulin resistance, increased kidney toxicity and kidney disease, increased obesity from this. Um, so you don't want to eat just cooked food. You've got to have some raw foods in your diet. So I'm not saying don't eat cooked food. I eat cooked foods every day. Mm -hmm. But I always try to get some raw foods in my diet also. Because one of the ways, well, before I get there, they did a study where they looked at a low-age diet versus a meal, a low-age meal versus a high-age meal. And they found that the difference in the blood flow into the brain, the, the carotid arteries, and how much the blood, the blood vessels open for blood flow to go into the brain at two, four, and six hours. Mm -hmm. And what did they find at two, four, and six hours? After six hours, what they found that the, the blood flow into the brain, the ability of that blood vessel to open up was 10 times more compromised in a high age meal, advanced glycation end product, compared to a low age meal. And that just shows right away, you gotta have more raw foods in your diet, you know, with, with your meal. Eat a nice big salad when you have a steak. Make sure to have a good salad with that. Uh, but it was 10 times more um, uh, inhibition of blood flow into the brain. Mm -hmm. Was that on just a general standard group of subjects? Yes. Okay. So are you, so are you saying, because I know a lot of people out there, of course we want to eat some raw foods with our cooked foods, but sometimes we don't have that option. So every time we have a just cooked food meal, we're reducing the blood flow to our brains? Well, that that's what the, the, the researchers are suggesting that, but there's some things that you can do if you take polyphenols. 
If you have some polyphenols, you reduce that impact dramatically. When you say take polyphenols, is this a supplement or you mean consume foods with polyphenols? Consume foods with polyphenols Which in them. Which are? Which are? Well, red wine, uh, beer, uh, gluten-free beer, but beer, and I've got a list because I don't want to forget any of okay. them. Berries, any berries, tea, um, olive oil, chocolate or cocoa, coffee, walnuts, peanuts, pomegranates, popcorn, yerba mate, and other fruits and vegetables. So the idea is, and that's a big list, you know, just have some polyphenols with your cooked meal and you reduce the age impact dramatically. Mm -hmm. Just eat cooked food and you're at risk of having this effect. Peanuts, typically in this health space, people say not to eat peanuts. So now you're saying we should eat peanuts to kind of offset this? Well, the problem with peanuts is the aflatoxins. Right. Um, well, there's also the sensitivity. If you have a sensitivity to a food, don't eat the food. Mm -hmm. But the toxins that can be on peanuts. And uh, um, I just look for organic peanuts. And that's what I, if I'm eating peanuts, that's what I go for. Organic peanut butter, um, organic peanuts. Organic popcorn. Exactly. Yeah. The beer. So you said gluten-free beer. If someone's not gluten sensitive and they know they're not gluten sensitive, can they drink the regular beer? Yes. Yeah, no, no reason why not. So let me be on tape to say this. Regular beer is okay for you if you don't have a gluten sensitivity. Gotcha. Wine. One glass of wine or are they really trying to load up to offset that cooked food? Because, you know, people want to use an excuse. Like, absolutely, I'm absolutely. My wine. I had nothing but cooked food today. I'm going to drink some wine tonight. One glass? Um, theoretically. Um, the researchers didn't talk about that, but theoretically, the higher the polyphenol content, um, the greater the inhibition of the detrimental effects of ages. Gotcha. Is there any supplement that people can take to offset it? Is there a particular supplement out there or kind of supplement that has high levels of polyphenols in it? There are. There are. The mixed green supplements, the mixed berry powders that uh, there's one on my website. It's great. Um, a scoop, I put a scoop in my protein drink every day. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but any, any of the concentrates of higher quality, hopefully organic, uh, fruits, um, uh, the powders uh, for kids. There's lots of new. There's lots of uh, products that have powdered berries in it for kids, or mm -hmm. or little chewable things that are uh, fruit based. Uh, uh, the goal is to have those polyphenols uh, uh, in the product to give to our kids. So earlier you were talking about peanuts and how people can have a sensitivity to peanuts. Right. Let's say someone does have to have that sensitivity and they consume peanuts, the immune system turns on. How long does it stay turned on for? Oh my goodness. That's the basis of why people don't heal on a gluten-free diet. Why is it that only about, depending on the study, 30% of celiacs heal on two years on a gluten-free diet? Why is that? It's because pop, 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 has a life of its own and it continues. And if you have intestinal permeability, the slang term leaky gut, if you have intestinal permeability, every patient that had an adverse reaction to food, meaning an allergy or a sensitivity reaction, every one of them had intestinal permeability in this study that I read. And every patient that was checked still had intestinal permeability six months after discontinuing the food. Pop, 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 pop has a life of its own. You have to put some attention on calming down the fire. You must begin an anti-inflammatory lifestyle to put the fire out. That means everything that you're learning on this digestion summit, everything mm -hmm. about, what about this piece of it? Yeah, that's a piece of the puzzle. Yep, that's a piece of the puzzle. How, how hard is that though? Because there's so many things that can trigger the immune system. I mean, we can't expect someone to completely remove everything and anything from their diet and from their lifestyle that's gonna trigger that so, so, where does being realistic come in here? That's really a good question, you know, and that's, that's the key to getting healthy. That's the key to not being part of the statistic of the number two worst healthcare system in the, in the world is how do you find balance in all of this? So, all right, advanced vacation, what's that? Oh man, I'm you know, cooked food? I, I'm just gonna eat cooked food. Well, of course you're gonna eat cooked food. Have some polyphenols with it. Learn what the list is of polyphenol foods. Look at the list, see what are the higher polyphenols, and then make sure that you have some of those regularly, and you calm down the fire. You, mm -hmm. you just have to calm down the fire, and you learn a little more all the time. Our society is a society that wants it simple, wants it quick. And you know, the bottom line for all that is, you know what's gonna happen? You're in your 60s, 
when our generation, not, not my generation, when your generation gets in their 60s, they're going to look like people today in their 80s. That's how their brains will be functioning because pa 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 is going on all the time. You're on my radio show maybe last year and you and I had an in-depth discussion about LPS, which I definitely recommend our audience check out on Blog Talk Radio or on iTunes. But you talked about, I think it was onions and carrots that have been in the refrigerator for a few days, how that can trigger LPS as well. Talk about that. That's a, really, that's a critical concept to consider. Uh, the study um, that showed this one, why is it that a carrot has this thicker, fibrous covering around it? Why is it that kids, if they're going to eat vegetables, they want carrots or peas? Because carrots are the sweetest of all fruits. They've got more sugar, of all vegetables. They've got more sugar than almost any other vegetable, right? So kids will eat carrots because they're sweet on their taste buds. But we peel off the outer layer because it's kind of fibrous and it doesn't taste or doesn't chew as easily. When you peel the outer layer off, you now are exposing the meat of the carrot to the air. There's bacteria in the air. The bad guy bacteria that we talked about earlier that's in our guts and it's opportunistic organism, we breathe it, it's in the air. And when you have peeled the carrot, you've removed the protective shield from the carrot so the bacteria in the air will land on the exposed carrot meat. Kept in the refrigerator at five degrees centigrade for four days, five degrees centigrade, you eat that carrot, the carrot now has colonies of LPS at concentrations high enough to cause intestinal permeability. Mm -hmm. Technically for the doctors, it stimulates toll-like receptor four, which is the gateway in the development of intestinal permeability. These are skin carrots, Skin though, right? carrots, So right. the skin's still on the carrot, it's in the refrigerator. Yes, yeah, fine, it's, not it's, a fine. Problem. it's okay. fine. But you know those little ba baby bags, or those bags of baby carrots mm -hmm. that people get? You, you really can't do that. You, you can't do it because the level of LPS, you, and yet, you know how they're in the refrigerator for a few too many days, and they feel kind of slippery? Right. And that's all bacteria hmm. that's on there. And then we eat these things, you know? And, and you, you cause more intestinal permeability, the leaky gut, the whole pop, 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 pop takes off systemically, pulling on your chain, and then wherever your weak link is, here come the symptoms, and the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. Those, the LPS from the carrots, or diced onions, the same thing, four days for diced onions. And the result is you've just pulled a little too hard on that chain, and now here come the consequences. We covered a lot of stuff here. I know people tend to remember two things, the, the first thing they heard and the last thing they heard. So one more time, can you give us uh, five or six action steps to take from this presentation? Oh, you bet, you bet. Have more polyphenols in your diet. Look at the list of polyphenols. Have more of them in your diet. Have blueberries in your diet regularly to help your brain and protect your gut. Um, eat more fresh food, fresh fruits and vegetables with your meals and avoid GMO foods whenever you can. As much as possible, have organic. Your website is thedoctor.com. You're, you're the host of the Gluten Summit. If somebody wanted to find out about the Gluten Summit, where should they go? You can go either to thedr.com, thedoctor.com, or to theglutensummit.com. Actually, just, just real quick, talk about some of the presenters that you had at the summit. Oh, I traveled the world, and I went to the world's experts. I went to the top people in the world. Dr. Uh, Professor Michael Marsh at Oxford in England, the godfather of celiac diagnosis, he'd never been interviewed. Unbelievable, he'd never been interviewed. You know, he's, this is just a guy in his office doing his research. He writes these papers that change the way doctors think, and but he'd never been interviewed. And what he told us about non-celiac gluten sensitivity was shocking. Professor Umberto Volta of Bologna, Italy. Professor Yehuda Schoenfeld in Tel Aviv the godfather of predictive autoimmunity, this whole world of identifying the weak link in your chain before it breaks, before you're diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. How do you find out about this? We talk about that in great detail on the summit. Yeah. Then I had seven nutritionists, world-class nutritionists, who talked about how do you begin implementing a gluten-free diet? Yeah, it was really fantastic, a great yeah. event. You know, while, while we're on this gluten topic, we're not ending yet, all right? I remember a couple months ago, there was a study that came out that said that the whole gluten thing was a, a fad, it was a hoax. We talked about that at an event. What, what was wrong with that? Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I just did a live cam, which is available on our website. You can click on it at thedoctor.com and you can watch the live cam of, um, I just uh, put it all in perspective. <laughs> you know, I call it the hullabaloo. 
And what happened was a, a blogger in Great Britain wrote a blog that this is a fad, it's just a fad, and there have been others that have done this, but he now quoted a study. The study came out in the journal Gastroenterology, a very reputable journal, in 2013. The title of the study was, No Effect of Gluten in Self-Reported Non-Celiac Gluten Sensitivity When FODMAPs Were Taken Out of the Diet. Those are carbohydrates, fermentable carbohydrates. So this blogger said, see, here's the study in gastroenterology, no effects of gluten. That's not what they said. If you read the study, oh man, here we go. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> when they looked at the group that they were going to check for this study, if they had elevated antibodies to gluten, they were excluded from the study. That was 37% of the people who were candidates for the study. They took them out. Nope, you've got gluten sensitivity, so uh, we're, we're not going to include you in the study. If they had the gene for celiac disease, HLA DQ2 or DQ8, which we now know 30 to 40 percent of people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity have the gene, but if they had the gene for celiac, they were taken out of the study. So that right there was at least 40 to 50 percent of the potential candidates were taken out of the study because they had non-celiac gluten sensitivity, mm. right? So then what they were left with were people that had some type of a problem with wheat, but they had excluded all those who obviously were NCGS patients, right? Even when then, they NCGS. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Okay. Even then, they found 8% of the people left in their study actually reacted to the protein. They did. Even though they didn't have the markers initially, they reacted to the protein. So the title of the study, and so what these researchers were trying to do was they were looking for people with GI complaints, um, gut complaints, and they took the carbohydrates out. Every one of them got better when they took the carbohydrates out, the fermentable carbohydrates, well, and said, no effect of gluten in self-reported non-celiac gluten sensitivity when we took out the FODMAPs. Well, they cherry-picked their subjects. You know, so I've got on my presentation, I've got a nice picture of two cherries. That, that's cherry picking, right? That's, that's cherry picking. They took out all the people who could have been having a problem with gluten. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Man. They took them out because they weren't looking for problems for gluten. They were looking for problems with the carbohydrates in wheat, not the gluten in wheat. So they took out the ones that had the problem with gluten. So they shouldn't have said no effects of gluten because 8% of the people that were still in the study did have an effect from the protein. So they should have titled the study minimal effects of gluten in self-reported non-celiac gluten sensitivity when we take out the FODMAPs. Now, eight months later, just two months ago, they published another study on non-celiac gluten sensitivity and depression, and they showed that de uh, people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, 92% of them, will suffer from depression with NCGS. So it's the same team of researchers. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, when you look at non-celiac gluten sensitivity, 92% of them suffer from depression. The same group of researchers. So th they, they mislabeled their study to say no effects. So someone who doesn't read the study and just looks at the title, comes across it somewhere, uses it for fodder mm -hmm. to be sensational, and so he wrote his blog, and the London Telegraph picked up on it. It was the front page of their paper, and then the London Times, the front page of the, their paper, study says no effect of gluten. Then it went to the Huffington Post. Then it went to the Wall Street Journal. Oh, man. Then it went to um, Forbes, and, and they all said no effects of gluten, which study says. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that. How much did that, that tick you off when you heard that? Oh, man. That's, you know... It's like, really? Really? You know, you know why it's a problem? You know why I get upset about it? Because tens of thousands of people will dismiss what they suspected was a problem with gluten. And that pop, 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 pop continues. And the weak link in their chain is their cerebellum, as an example. I did a study of 316 people, consecutive patients in my office, 316 of them. And I checked them all for cerebellar antibodies. That's antibodies to a part of your brain that controls how you move, how your muscles move. 26% of them had elevated antibodies. Everyone that comes in the office, 26% of them had elevated antibodies to their brain, mm. killing off their brain. And it, it doesn't lay there dormant, it's killing off brain cells every day, a few more. 
Why is it that you see people in their 60s and 70s, they can't walk very well? They can't, you know, they don't have good balance. They're apprehensive about walking downstairs because their cerebellum's, their cerebellum's been burned out from years of being attacked. That's why that upset me so much is because tens of thousands of people believe Forbes and they believe Wall Street Journal and they believe London Times because some, say it, challenged, <laughs> some challenged blogger going for sensationalism represents himself as an expert. Mm -hmm. And the result is tens of thousands of people will be misled. It's so easy to become an expert online these days. Oh man. So easy. Like you said, things just catch fire. Right. It goes to Huffington Post, it goes to the Wall Street Journal, it just, it just keeps going. Exactly. It's, it's, it's exactly. Bad. So this mm -hmm. time together with you today, thank you for this opportunity. It's just to give you some pearls, some little pieces of, well, what do you mean cook food's bad, bad for you? No, it's not bad for you. It's just, that's life. You cook food, you produce ages. So cut down the, the percentage of your meal being cooked food, increase raw foods a little bit, you're fine. You know, eat some blueberries, you're fine. Just don't eat carrots four days after they're peeled, you're fine. Just learn a couple of these tips because you have to learn all these little tips to take care of this machine so that you can dance through life and take your grandkids hiking in the Alps in your 80s. One last thing for you, is there ever gonna be another gluten summit? There is. May of 2015. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Dr. Tom, thanks so much. Thanks, Sean.